Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Sean Alvidge and I lead the Space Environment Group at the University of Birmingham, the Serene Group. And our research is focused on modelling of the upper atmosphere and the impact that space weather has on that. And this afternoon I want to talk about the next generation of space weather forecast models, the research that's being done at the University of Birmingham to push forward the state of the art. So earlier in the week, uh, Dr. David Temmins, who's a lecturer in our research group, gave an excellent overview of the space weather impacts on radio communications and navigation systems with a particular background and introduction to the Earth's ionosphere. Now, this talk will follow on from that, but you don't, if you didn't see it, you can still get everything you want from this one. But I would highly recommend you go back uh, and look at that. And I've put a link here on the slide. The one sentence overview of what we're trying to do here is that our sun is active. It is constantly changing and evolving and spitting material out into space. And this activity gives rise to the phenomenon of space weather, which has a broad range of impacts. So a simple video here of a coronagraph showing what the sun's doing. It's spitting material out into interplanetary space. Here the little white uh, circle shows you the size of the sun underneath a disk to block out the main light. Uh, and in this video, what you can see in particular is some nice activity as well as this streaking line here, which is in fact a comet, Comet Ison from 2013, which had a near miss uh, with the sun. Now, before I go into sort of the work I want to focus on today, let me give you a bit more background information into space weather. So ESA made this nice graphic which summarises a broad range of impacts and events uh, and technological impacts that space weather uh, can affect. So we start up here at the top uh, with the sun. You can see we have a coronal mass ejection here. This is a colossal, you know, maybe 10 to the 12 kilogram uh, thrown out of the sun which I think Earth's way flares. Hello? Solar energetic Can't hear you. Solar flares You're muted. The most commonly media reported space weather uh, event. You're muted. Anyway, as these things travel through interplanetary space, they can impact our satellites, causing perhaps solar cell degradation, single event upsets, the, ra the satellites themselves can experience radiation damage. And then as that gets towards the, the Earth even closer, towards the Earth's atmosphere, what we can get is an impact on a various number of systems. And a lot of these, certainly in this slide, come from the impacts on the ionosphere, which Dr. Temmins had mentioned. So we can get geomagnetically induced currents in power systems. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Uh, we can get disturbed reception because when we have this extra noise uh, in the ionosphere, it can interrupt the signals that we're expecting to pass through it. And that might give you navigation errors. So you're driving in your car, you're trying to connect your GPS for positioning. The ionosphere has changed. It's undergoing some space weather event that's impacted it. Then that will change your solution uh, for the GPS and you can be impacted there. Obviously, the pretty most photographed impact of space weather are the northern lights, the aurora, the southern lights. And we can also see uh, other navigation impacts and also radiation to both uh, astronauts, but also in extreme events to people in uh, airplanes. And again, I'll talk a little bit more about that before I go into some of the tools and techniques we use to try and mitigate space weather. So starting off with this space radiation one, just with a, a quick slide. So radiation in space comes from highly energetic uh, atomic nuclei, most of which are, are protons. And this extreme environment means that we in fact designate astronauts as radiation workers. So in, a, in this image here on the top right, this is uh, Neil Armstrong's dosimeter from Apollo 11, measuring the amount of radiation that he had uh, experienced, and all astronauts have these. And on the ISS, um, what I've just highlighted here at the back is a picture of a dosimeter, which, OK, on this one, it's not actually on the individual astronauts. They normally have them on themselves, on the spacesuits. But you can see that it's constantly measuring the radiation environment that they're experiencing. And this is something which fluctuates over time. It's not a constant background level of radiation. If you have a space weather event, you might get this increase in radioactive material, 
uh, which is hurtling towards the ISS. And in the more extreme cases, uh, astronauts can be asked to shield themselves in slightly uh, better radiation shield parts of the space station. But a major event can, in fact, also impact passengers uh, on airlines. Now, we know that there's background levels of radiation and there's radiation all around us. And in fact, the solar's radiation is normally uh, blocked out by our you know, nice and thick atmosphere. But occasionally we can get major events which disrupt that. And here's a little chart of the kind of radiation exposure we can see. So don't really worry about the units. It's not particularly important. But as I said, loads of things give out radiation. So there's the obvious things like having an X-ray at the dentist, but even down to a bag of Brazil nuts in the supermarket. They are giving out this low level amount of radiation. And for scale, what I've highlighted here is a transatlantic flight. So we've picked transatlantic because you're you know, in the air a bit longer. You go slightly higher latitudes. Uh, and you, you get a, a low level of radiation, but it's clearly not very much, especially compared to just the UK average background here. But if we take that same transatlantic flight, but during a solar storm, you can see there's a massive increase in the amount of radiation that you would experience. Now, again, that for an individual is not uh, an amount that we need to worry about. You shouldn't, you know, don't worry about flying and there being a space weather event. It is more of an issue for people who are doing that route regularly. So the crew, these people are doing this for back and forth, back and forth over long periods of time. And during more uh, extreme times of solar activity, so it's been quite quiet recently, the solar cycle has been in a, a minimum, it's just starting perhaps to, to pick up again. But during solar maximum, when there's a lot of activity and you're doing a lot of these flights, then in fact the radiation perhaps will start to uh, build up. But again, we obviously need to keep all of this uh, in mind because you have to see here, you know, the ISS is a, a, a much larger number that these astronauts are experiencing on a, a yearly basis uh, for those. Obviously, a few have been there for a year, normally only six months or so. So radiation is one of these impacts that we feel from space weather a lot. The challenge there, of course, is that these things are moving almost at the speed of light. So it's very hard to understand or predict when they're going to be. As soon as we've observed them, we've been hit by them. So what we need to be able to do is try and forecast when are they more likely to happen. And that's the holy grail of space weather research at the moment, which is accurate and actionable forecasts of the sun and what's that going to have happen downstream. So another impact uh, that I want to briefly mention are geomagnetically induced currents. And this is certainly one that governments around the world get uh, particularly excited about and try to make sure that we mitigate against them. So a CME, a coronal mass ejection, that's the thing that's been thrown off the sun, um, at, let's say a thousand metres a second or something. So it's hurtling through space and these are these have their own sort of embedded magnetic field and fluctuations in that magnetic field and fluctuations with the Earth's magnetic field from a pretty simple uh, you know, high school physics generate electric fields on Earth. And these geomagnetically induced currents, GICs, can flow uh, into power lines and transformers. Now, on the whole, that's not a huge problem. I mean, the power lines themselves don't mind having this um, induced current flow down them. It's been happening for, you know, it didn't happen since we started using electricity. It's been happening for billions of years. But now we've decided rather than let it dissipate through rocks and in the ground, we like electricity, uh, but we also don't want to pay a lot for it. So we have very low resistance uh, cabling and infrastructure to transport uh, electricity around the country, around the world. And so now this is a nicer place for the induced current to, to flow through. And again, that's not a huge problem, but this induced geoelectric field varies at a frequency which is much less than the network's frequency. So the network operating frequency fluctuates at about 50 hertz. 
about 50 times a second. And this induced field varies much, much lower than that. So to the system, it doesn't seem like it's actually flowing because it's much lower than the 50 hertz. So it's not varying. So really, if the system thinks it's a direct current um, rather than an alternating current. Now, I've called it here a quasi-direct current because it's obviously not really direct. It's just what the system feels like. Quasi-direct current can magnetize the transformer's core. So it's fine traveling along the cable. It's when it gets to the transformer that we have a problem. And it starts, it can saturate one half of that alternating current uh, voltage. So it just is really, that's really not nice for the transformer. And this can have a variety of impacts. But obviously in the worst case, you get rapid heating. And if it's, you know, especially if maybe the transformer is older or has some existing uh, degradation, then we can get thermal damage to the transformer. It can melt parts of the inside and completely take it offline. Now, usually we don't see these events happening and then all of the transformers around the country just burn out. But what they can do is artificially age the system uh, significantly. And in the most extreme events, perhaps we will see some transformer damage. And obviously, if you your transformer gets damaged, you're potentially taking that power station off the grid, which is going to have a massive impact on the UK wide uh, network. And these impacts are obviously not just UK centric. They're going to happen anywhere across the world. Now, there are different regions which are impacted differently, but fundamentally, these are worldwide problems. And space weather is a big, broad uh, problem that the, the world uh, potentially uh, can face. So that's just two little brief backgrounds. Let me get back on to the main topic I want to, want to talk about, which is the thermosphere ionosphere system. So as you heard earlier in the week, that the ionosphere is the charged region of the upper atmosphere, has this massive impact because if we're sending a signal from the ground to the satellites, then obviously it depends on frequency, but a lot of those are impacted by the ionosphere. Uh, perhaps the most famous example being GNSS, GPS systems, which uh, you need to correct for the ionospheric impact or your positioning just doesn't work. That's the charge part. There is a neutral part of the atmosphere, uh, which we call the thermosphere. And that runs, you know, both of these systems run from, I don't know, let's say around 50, 60 kilometers up to 1,500, 2,000 kilometers, something in, in that range. And we're interested in both of these, uh, which will be hopefully come apparent in a minute. But the, while the ionosphere is affecting the communications uh, primarily, the thermosphere impacts the satellite itself. In low Earth orbit, the kind of altitudes we're talking about, sub 2,000, sub 1,000 kilometres, where this video is taken from on the International Space Station at about uh, 400 kilometres, there is still uh, enough um, air, <laughs> as it were. I mean, there are enough. It's not a perfect vacuum that drag on the satellites is still a major impact. And that is one of the fundamental things that stops us predicting exactly where a satellite is going to be in the future, because we don't exactly know what the space environment looks like. So we don't know exactly how much drag is facing on it. So it makes it harder to predict where the satellite is going to be. And we want to try and solve both of those problems. And as Dr. Demings uh, Dr. Themins had highlighted, there is ways that we can use um, statistical or physics-based models of the ionosphere and the same for the thermosphere to predict those. But the next step is to include data as well, data assimilation. Now, I say next step, this has already been done. Um, multiple models across the globe uh, do this already, but there are things we need to do to take that to the next level. So I've just listed here a couple of uh, radio frequency systems which are impacted by the ionosphere. GPS, Galileo, these are your global navigation systems. Uh, Space-based radar, um, early warning radar, HF, high frequency radar, and also high frequency comms communications, which the airlines still strongly rely on. Now, these statistical models are pretty useful for planning. They give us a good idea of the long term impacts but they don't let us do something in the short term, which is highly accurate. And that's where the data assimilation comes from. 
And this is on the ionosphere side. We also get a similar thing on the thermosphere. And that's like what I just said in terms of satellite position. So collision avoidance has become a routine task in space operations. And ESA, in fact, move satellites out of the way. If we think two satellites are going to get too close to each other, you literally have to try and move one out of the way. But we don't always get that right. Um, the two biggest impacts that stop these being perfect Laplerian orbits are geopotential and atmospheric drag. Now, we've got a pretty good hold on the geopotential, and we can include that in our orbit propagators, which leaves atmospheric drag, or really thermospheric density, as the largest unknown in this system. And clearly, the ionosphere, the charge, and the thermosphere, neutral and ion environment are, are coupled and highly linked, and so we can, we can try and address both of these at once. Okay, but... There is also another reason why this is hard. So really what we're trying to do is space weather forecasting, which is sort of like it seems. It's like the weather forecasting that the Met Office do, just looking up a bit. But it's difficult because we have a whole range of different timescales that we're trying to work on. So we can have impacts from the sun which take, you know, which travel basically at the speed of light and can be felt just over eight minutes later. Um, and again, this is referring back to the talk a few days ago, if these sort of words down here aren't that important. But if you're interested in the details, these are the different regions and the different types of the, ion the different parts of the ionosphere that this impacts. But we have EM radiation impacts of about eight minutes, which we want to try and account for. Then we can have impacts from cosmic rays, which can be impacts ranging from 15 minutes to a few hours. And then if there's a, uh, something that's, say, leaving the surface of the sun, changes in the solar wind, solar flare, uh, coronal mass ejections, the coronal mass ejection itself, whilst travelling very fast, still has a rather large time delay until it travels to the Earth. And this, I've said here, could be 30 to 60, but in practice, some have been faster, maybe 17, 18 hours. And, but when that then hits the Earth, we see all manner of different impacts on the ionosphere and the thermosphere system. So what we're trying to forecast is something which the sun can control on vastly different timescales. From eight minutes to, let's say, 60 hours, we need to try and model all of those things. And to be honest, the space weather forecasting is a relatively new science. The Met Office have been doing weather forecasting for... 50, 60 years, um, the space weather community is still relatively young uh, in that regard. And as well as these sort of shorter term, let's say, you know, eight minutes to 60 hour impacts, there are long term variabilities. And I think you saw this slide earlier in the week, but this is just showing the impacts of the solar cycle from the 1960s to present day of how this is the F 10.7, the solar flux at 10.7 centimetres, but it's strongly correlated to the sunspot number. And what you can see is that as it goes up and down, we have this different level of background uh, strength in, in, in trying to model it. So we know our models need to take account of long-term variability. We also then have medium-term variability. So this is a measure of the total electron content, the TEC. So this is a really common thing we use in the ionosphere. This is basically looking at an integrated column uh, from the ground up, up to a, a GPS height, and just sort of the total number of electrons in that area. Um, so the units aren't that important, but just so you know what that is. And over here, this maps into ionospheric range error in meters. So depending on the signal you're transmitting, so if you're at 400 megahertz or 1.2 gigahertz, a kind of GPS frequencies, then this is the range error caused by the ionosphere. But what I want to show you here is each line of this is a day measuring the total electron content uh, from Ascension Island, um, but each day in September. And so we know from this chart that in one day, the, or in one month, there isn't going to be much variability. There might be some background variability, but it's going to be roughly the same. But still, we can see each day, whilst it has the same structure, the same kind of sunrise uh, that you see here, and sun setting, the same rising and diurnal variation, 
the actual numbers we see vary hugely, you know, maybe double this line here down at about 60 uh, TEC uh, tech and up here at over 120. So even if the long term variability is pretty stable, we see this medium term day to day changes. You can't just make one thing and just set and forget. It has a long term variability. And then finally, we also have some short term variability in that the Earth is not equally distributed with what the ionosphere looks like. There's different parts and structures. So here we've got a sort of a, a graphic here of the kind of thing we look at. This middle section here uh, is nighttime. This is uh, midnight uh, in the UK. And then we have this what's called the equatorial anomaly. This is enhanced regions of the, the ionosphere is enhanced in these regions, sort of 15 to 20 degrees north and south of the magnetic equator, which is drawn here in black, uh, which is a predomin predominantly a, a daytime event. And that just travels around as the as we go. And then we also have high latitude impacts, the polar cap, the auroral oval and the what we call the ionospheric trough. And these are these are regular structures, but they move around as the day moves to night and these happen on a you know these have daily variability so ascension island is, is say plonked around where's ascension about here somewhere and so one of the things is that we see as we go from day to night the equatorial anomaly might just pass over that and that has part of this cause for this uh, medium term variability so a model that we have needs to capture all of these things and also combine it with data to try and get the really best idea of what's going on. So then we might be able to try and forecast that going forwards. So what is the current state of the art with our modelling? Well, I think it was highlighted to you that primarily we see that data assimilation models do best. If you take a model, you add in data, it does best, which is what you would hope and expect. The problem is most data assimilation DA models that we currently have are based on statistical climate models. They're based on these quick, cheap, um, easy to run models, and then data is added on the top to push them to try and be more like weather models. So we're taking a climate model, adding data to try and make it a weather model. And to be honest, they do pretty much as good as I think they're going to do, uh, given the current what they are meant, what they're built to do. So in general, they don't in take into account large chunks of the underlying physics. And one of those things is called TIDs, traveling ionospheric disturbances. And given that they, these models don't embed that, we, th we see that the data simulation models with these statistical backgrounds perform close to the minimum achievable errors that you don't take these into account. Now, the problem is that doesn't give us an obvious route to forecasting. If you have a climatological model and that you've added some data and you've got a really good estimate of what the ionosphere looks like right now, how do you say what is the ionosphere going to look like in one hour's time? Now, if it's a few minutes in the future, you can sort of say it just the same as it is now, that kind of persistence, and that works really well. And there are some techniques that can do short term forecasting, let's say an hour, two hours like that. But if you want to make a 24 hour or 48 hour forecast, these models are not going to give you that route. Now, there are a few things that people have tried to do. Um, people have tried to do machine learning techniques, and those are certainly being explored currently. But that relies fundamentally on looking at historical data and saying that if the ionosphere or the thermosphere looks like this now, and it did in the past, what did it do in the past? Well, it did this. And it's sort of machine learning is just going to say, well, let's assume that it's going to do that again. And maybe that's going to be right a lot of the time, um, but it's certainly not going to always be right. So one of the other things we can do is we can replace that background statistical climate model with a physics based model, a first principle model of the ionosphere thermosphere, which solves the underlying equation and then can try and propagate things forward to get us good forecasts. And that's great. That's a good way to go forward. The only problem is that those physics models are much more um, computationally expensive, yes, but also just underlying, they're more difficult to run than the statistical models. And when you start trying to add in the data, which they were never really built for, sometimes they might get a bit angry and they push back. We want to take that data assimilation that we know is a great approach
and add it in with uh, background physics first principle models uh, for the next generation uh, of models. So I mentioned on the previous slide things that we were missing. Uh, and one of those things was TIDs, traveling artifact disturbances. So here's a video uh, from the continental US, which you can see this wave-like structure coming in uh, from the west to the east. Now, these are actually very small uh, changes in, in tech, total electron content. But you can see that wave-like structure flowing in across the US. And that's what these statistical models don't embed. So if you're trying to get a hold of that in your model, it needs to be entirely data driven and forecasting that then becomes uh, really difficult. And these are the kind of things we want to have embedded in our models, the ability to predict this passing uh, wave like structure. OK, so data simulation, really simple, really uh, at the heart of it. And that is that we have a model. It sits there. It, maybe it's my physics model we're interested in. Maybe it's a data simulation. Uh, sorry, maybe it's a, uh, a statistical model. It doesn't really matter. We have a model and it can spit out model results here. But now we're going to assume that we have some observations and that might be GPS observations. Uh, I think called an ionosond to measure what the ionosphere is doing. We have some observations and the process of assimilation is the merging of the model with the observations. Uh, to get improved model results. And then we can just repeat that loop endlessly. Every time step, we can spit out some model results. We can get some more data. We can update the model with that data and spit out new model results. And as long as we have observations coming in, we can continually improve it. And this is exactly what the Met Office do for their weather forecasting. They are making global observations all of the time uh, and adding them to their uh, background models to come up with the best improved model result they can give for what the system is going to look like. Now there are a whole host of types of data assimilation. I'm not going to go into all of these, just uh, some that you might have, well, one you may have heard of is the Kalman filter, which we know is optimal. It's a great system. It's also you know, cheap and easy to run, but it does require the system to have no biases and to be Gaussian primarily is what we need and linear, a linear Gaussian non-biased system. So if you've got a perfect system, the Kalman filter is the perfect way of merging it with data. In practice, we don't uh, usually have that. Um, and then the exact opposite of that, something which can deal with non-Gaussian, non-linear um, complexities is called the particle filter. But that's at the other end of my little chart here of cost versus complexity which basically says that actually particle filters can be hard to implement and also very expensive computationally to, to do. Now, we are getting better at using them, but they're still a long way off being the norm. In practice, we try and use something in between these, which is usually an ensemble Kalman filter or in space weather ensemble Kalman filters. In other communities, they, they're interested maybe more in 3D or 4D VAR variational methods. And this just a little chart shows you there's a range of complexity and cost when you decide well which of these we we're going to use. But let me try and explain without maybe the mathematics what the fundamental problem is. So let's say I have a model um, and I have some now cast here. Uh, we could be just using our Kalman filter or something like that. But what I want to do is I need to get something uh, going forward. And I'd like to capture the uncertainty. I'd like to understand what's the probability of something happening. So I have my now cast and there are some uncertainty. So the size of this oval is just meant to represent the error, whatever that means, the relative error in something. And that could come from uh, the errors we get just while now casting. And then what we want to do is propagate that forward. But when we propagate it forward, there's loads of things we don't understand. We might have nonlinear dynamics, which make things go not how we're expecting. We obviously never quite know what the environment looks like. So we get these sort of uncertainty in the environment. And even the numerical methods we use are not obviously completely accurate. And what we can end up with is a forecast which has a much larger error size than the now cast. So we're trying to take our now cast and make a forecast. But there is some uncertainty and we've increased our uncertainty. Um, but we could do that. You could take a model now. You could take perhaps the simple statistical model, make a forecast and just say, well, it's got a larger error. But exactly how big this error is, is quite difficult because these impacts are hard to quantify numerically. 
And so this is how we do a standard uh, deterministic forecast. So we're going to, you know, any point here is equally likely. Uh, we make our forecast, it gives us some point over there. You remember our ovals, we've just dropped those for points. And then let's assume, we obviously never know this, that there is some true state. So our now cast wasn't quite right. Actually, this is what the, the ionosphere looked like. And after the forecast, it, you know, it looked like this, but we said it was over here. We never can see this, this sort of line at the bottom. We never know what's that's happening. Uh, this is instead what we can do. And if you take the current uh, primary work that the current state of the art has focused on, this is what you get. You can get a forecast with some uncertainty. We're not really sure, um, but it might be quite far off. And that you can get from using a Kalman filter. Um, if you have to deal with these biases and non-Gaussian assumptions, but there are ways to, to handle that. What we want to do is replace that with an ensemble. So this is called the ensemble Kalman filter. And really what that means is it's a way of trying to estimate some of the underlying statistics that we don't really know by having lots of different instances of the ionosphere. So here's a, a, a lovely picture that I like um, from, I mean, this is again for weather forecasting, but we can run lots and lots of variants of our model and they can give us very different, no, they can give us, they might be very different, but normally they give us slightly different outputs. They don't have to be colossally different, but they give us some difference. And if we can sample that original now casting point repeatedly, so if we can look at this in multiple instances, propagate all of those forward, that will give us a better idea of the range of possible outcomes. And this is how, again, modern things like hurricane predictions work. We can take a whole host of hurricane forecasts, and if lots of points end up near each other, then perhaps we're going to have more confidence that given the error in our starting state, we might get closer and closer to a good prediction uh, at the end there. And, oh, and here is an example of exactly that. So now we know that my original now cast, and this was the error, so any point in here is equally likely in this cloud. I'm going to take lots of them in my ensemble, and I'm going to propagate all of them forward 12 hours. And now I'm going to have a look at the spread of, of all those points. And you can see that in this case, there's been quite a large amount of divergence. And I don't know that any, any of these points are equally likely. So I don't know that if this point, which ended up over here, or this point, which ended up down here, I don't know which of those is correct. So I have to accept that my forecast has this level of uncertainty uh, based into it. Now, if all of these points were tightly clustered, then our uncertainty would be massively reduced. But normally they aren't. And we can use ensemble Kalman filters, these are ensemble data assimilation techniques, in order to be able to push this forward and to give people probabilistic predictions of space weather. Again, this is something that we become really used to in terrestrial weather. You look on your phone's weather app or, or watch on the telly, we might talk about a 75% chance of rain. Now, we can only get to these probabilities by using ensembles. And in space weather, that's what we need to be doing moving forward. We need to be replacing our deterministic forecast of this is my forecast. I accept it's not going to be perfect, but I'm at least going to give you one to this is my forecast, but it has this amount of uncertainty. And so that is where we need to be moving in terms of predicting these things going forwards. Now, at the University of Birmingham, we've built a model called the Advanced Ensemble Electron Density Assimilation System, and it's a mouthful, um, called Aeneas which does exactly this. So it is a data assimilation model that uses an ensemble Kalman filter um, with a physics-based background, a first principles background model that's coupled of both the thermosphere and the ionosphere. And it can take in a whole range of different global data and it can predict um, going out, it can do good now cast, but then you can also make probabilistic forecasts. Now I've put here approximately 24 hours. This is really hard because of that short term variability. If the sun stays quiet and calm, you can get good 24 hour forecasts. If a one hour into your forecast, there's a major solar eruption, then your forecast can go um, off the boil pretty quickly. And to overcome that, what we need are probabilistic forecasts of the sun, which we can then embed into our model to get better and better predictions. And this is a primary thing that I work on at the University um, of Birmingham. Now, 
I think you've even seen this exact slide, but the reason I just want to highlight it is to say again why this is hard. Because the primary thing we observe is the ionosphere. I mean, we don't have measurements everywhere, but we do have some. Uh, and that's this line here. But if I'm trying to make a thermosphere model as well, um, which this does both, and we're interested in that thermosphere, remember, for the satellite drag, well, I need to try and get a handle on all of these different things. I would like to know how the helium has changed, how the oxygen has changed, and I might not have observations of those. But again, that's what data assimilation can do for us. The ensemble camera filter lets me try and estimate how all of these different lines are related. So if I change one, how should I update the other ones? And again, that's a, a, a big challenge, but it's something that we can do using the ensemble Kalman filter. It lets us estimate if we're gonna if we want to use the correct terminology, the background covariance matrix, the covariance between the different elements in here. And that's something that we're doing in the background of Aeneas is we're trying to work out all of these covariances. So when I take an observation of the ionosphere, I can propagate it forward into other domains as well. OK, so another reason why this is hard is let's look at some of the output of things you get. So this is the lower boundary wind. So this is towards the bottom of uh, the Aeneas model, about 100 kilometres. And this is what the winds look like. And this is just driving the bottom. And these are clearly difficult things to try and model when you don't have observations. There are very few observations of wind speeds at 100 kilometres. It's too low for satellite observations and it's primarily and it's too high for things like weather balloons. So it's, it can be really hard to get a hold of what that's actually doing. And that can have a massive impact on the system just from looking at the bottom. Similarly, if we go to the top of the model at about 600 kilometres and look at temperature, we can also see some strange fluctuations. So this is, as you can see, the Earth uh, superimposed in the middle, and then the colour represents the temperature, and then you can also see some height variability. But if you look around the high latitudes here towards the North Pole, you can see, OK, sometimes it stays fairly smooth and perhaps predictable. But then as different data source comes in, as the sun will be doing stuff, the model says, well, actually, it all goes a bit crazy here. And we get this strange structures happening uh, underneath the surface. Um, and we have to try and model that because if I have a satellite, you know, this is at 600 kilometers. If I have a satellite passing through this region, then the drag that it's going to experience, the environment it's going to experience is significantly different from uh, other times of the day or year. So we can't just assume the satellite's going to carry on forever going around there. There are these major differences that we're trying to model, uh, we're trying to account for in the model. OK, so let me just try and bring this all to some form of conclusion, talking a little bit about the data that we are currently assimilating. So we have this thing called Arnesons, and this is uh, just a, an image of these points dotted out all over the globe where we can get data to put into the model. And these are really nice sounding instruments of the ionosphere. They are designed to tell us what the ionosphere looks like. However, they are expensive. And whilst the dots look like there's quite a lot, they are fairly sparse, especially in regions which we know are really tricky. I talked very uh, a while ago now about the equatorial anomaly, this region around the magnetic equator, which has this heightened um, uh, density. And there are not certainly, you know, over Central Africa here, there are very few observations um, of that system. And if we want to do real model forecasting, we also are going to want things that are in red here, which are in real time. This this station here, for example, in not real time is useful for then going back and recalculating what the ionosphere looked like, but not great going forward. So this is a great data set, but it's not huge. So we need to supplement it with other ones. And one of the biggest databases is that total electron content that we talked about earlier that we can estimate from GPS receivers. So the GPS receivers were not put out there, or most of them weren't put out there for space weather usage. They were put out there for other reasons. But we can use that data, stuff that other people might see as noise, to try and work out what uh, the ionosphere is doing. And hopefully here you can actually see that day to night variability because the, the sort of orangey red colours are daytime. That's the peak. And you can see it flow from the east across uh, to the west.
and that is just day and night going round. No modelling done here, this is just output from GPS receivers all over the globe, uh, and we can just see those going round and round daily and daily. And we can take this data set and add it into our model and combine it with direct observations of the ionosphere here to get a nice accurate idea of what the ionosphere looks like. There's a problem though. So here's just a snapshot of that data that we're assimilating. But the problem is there are some gaps um, and there's more obviously listed, but these are over the oceans. We don't have GPS receivers over the oceans, so we have major data gaps that we want to fill in. Now, you could maybe stick some GPS receivers on ships and send those out, uh, and that's been done and tested. The problem there is that you're reliant, obviously, on shipping lanes uh, to go in the right places, and that's still not going to cover everything. So the thing that we can overcome, or the thing we can try and overcome this with, is satellite data. Satellite data doesn't care where the oceans are, and it can give us an idea of what the ionosphere or what the atmosphere is doing. And the primary thing that I'm just going to end with here is a talk about radio occultation data. So radio occultation data is we have our satellite here. This is FOMOSAT-3, uh, which is in low Earth orbit. And it can see the GPS satellite, which is, you know, out in medium Earth orbit. And as it passes through the ionosphere, you get this bending uh, of the signal and it's received. But we can basically work out, we know where the two satellites are, so we can work out this amount of bending, and we can invert that information to find out, well, that must tell us something about what the ionosphere is doing. And this is the premise of radio occultation, which is incredibly useful because it can fit this, this little bending here, this entry and exit point of the ionosphere, it can tell us loads about places over the ocean that we don't currently have. Now, Historically, there hasn't been a lot of satellites uh, up there to give us radio occultation data, but we are on the point where that is changing. This is a revolution in terms of space weather data that we're going to have access to. And this is going to primarily come from commercial entities. So previously, there have been NASA, there have been uh, the Japanese Space Agency missions to give us radio occultation data. But now there are a number of commercial companies which are launching satellites for radio occultation data, which they can then sell to um, other users. Now, the space weather community is, you know, not that big that it needs three different companies competing for it. But I should say that radio occultation data is also incredibly useful for the MET community, for the terrestrial weather people. They're also using this occultation data. So it has multiple uses. And these are the three big players, uh, Spire Global, Planet IQ and GeoOptics. They're the, the three, the big teams, and perhaps Spire the biggest of all of those in terms of current satellite fleet. So what we have been using historically is this kind of thing. So this is from a, a set of six satellites called Cosmic, um, which gives you about 2,000 occultations a day. Uh, which look, you know, something like this. I mean, they're not always, um, they're not actually evenly spread like this usually, but this is the idea you get for 2,000 occultations a day. Um, there's been an upgraded system that's been recently launched, Cosmic 2B. Now, this image is now not quite true, really, because what ended up happening is there were going to be 12 satellites, uh, six in a high inclination and six in low inclination. Only the six in low inclination have been launched, so you wouldn't actually you wouldn't get observations in this high latitude region from Cosmic 2B. You only get them in a more narrow equatorial region. But again, this is just showing you what a 5,000 occultation per day coverage looks like. Uh, and in fact, we have an instrument down here on Cape Verde. Um, you see a pretty big instrument here of two people from the Serene Group that is taking observations from these from these satellites. And that's the current state of where we are. But this is what we're looking at getting towards. So if you can, if I can quickly flick back and you see my data gaps, I want you to keep this in mind as we look at these final few slides, that one of the commercial providers are talking about having this by the end of next year. This is 15,000 occultations per day. These are observations that we can put into our data simulation models. And those gaps have been filled in because these are going to be distributed all over the Earth. But we can take that a step forward. By the end of 2023, we're talking about 50,000 occultations a day. And this fills in basically everywhere. Now, again, when we're doing data simulation, we might need it you know, quicker than every day. You might be on you know, every 15 minutes, which massively cuts down the number you see here. But still, we are filling in the gaps 
that we can't get GPS data. That GPS data is still going to be invaluable to us. The Arneson data is going to be invaluable to us. But this radio occultation data gives us the opportunity to fill in the gaps that we never have had previously. And perhaps if we combine that data with current developing state-of-the-art models, which understand more and more about the physical system, we can get closer and closer to really excellent forecasts of what space weather and the ionosphere and the thermosphere is doing. And I think that is what the next generation of forecast models will look like. We need to use new data that we haven't even started to think about yet. We need to use new satellite missions, dedicated space weather operation missions that are going to go out and observe what the sun's doing. So we can predict what the sun's going to do so I can feed that into my upper atmosphere model. My upper atmosphere model needs to be combined quickly but accurately with as much data as possible. And we want to propagate that physics forward so we can predict what's going to happen. If we can predict what's going to happen, we can tell people about it and we can try and save, you know, millions, billions of pounds, potentially. We can help say, actually, these two satellites are not going to hit each other because we've now predicted it. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important because unnecessary collision avoidance manoeuvres cost um, ESA, the European Space Agency, something like 200 million euros a year because they move things that didn't need moving because we're so unsure about where things are going to be. And I think there's going to be a large drive from commercial satellite operators because these people are investing money into deploying fleets of satellites, uh, which they can then sell the data to, to people to use in our models. At the University of Birmingham, the Space Environment Group is at the forefront of this research. Uh, we've recently won a number of large uh, grants which are to develop, to take our model, Anais, that we've just talked about, and to make it operational at the Met Office. So that means to have it run like the weather model routinely and regularly so the output can be provided to users who need to know right now what is the atmosphere going to look like in 24 hours? What does the atmosphere look like now? Um, these are really important things. If you want to find out more about the research we do or opportunities of how you can get involved, uh, certainly the, the lecturing staff in the group are always interested in PhD applications, then if you go to birmingham.ac.uk slash space weather, then you can find out a lot more about our background. You can see a one minute video of me talking. Um, I'm sure you really want to. Uh, you can see other videos that our group's produced and also more information about our models our papers and anything like that. Um, so please, you know, reach out to us uh, and get involved. It's an exciting, it's an exciting area uh, at the moment. A lot of interesting things going on and there's a lot of global interest in getting that output as accurate as possible. So thank you and I'll, I'll happily now answer a few questions that you might have. Hi. I can. No, absolutely. Okay. Nice.